that we don't, we can't do well. I thank you so much for the mothers that have taken us in, whether they're our blood or um, our friends. And we just lift them up to you today and we just pray that you would rain down blessing on them. And God, I pray for our speaker today that she would uh, speak your word and you would speak through her and touch our hearts today. 
we thank you so much. Haven't we all been there? We want to believe, but, you know, what we've been unpacking over these past few weeks is literally that. We want to say we want to believe, but there's something in our life, maybe there's a circumstance, maybe there's something we're walking through uh, that's just a stumbling block for us to believe. And so as we've been unpacking over these last few series, uh, these last few weeks of the series, I'm so excited for today that is Mother's Day. And I just want to welcome everyone in. Maybe you're listening online. You know, we have folks from all over the world that listen to this throughout the week. It is absolutely crazy. We are so thankful to live in a time just like this, where God allows us to literally be his light throughout the world. It is so crazy. It is so awesome. So I'm so thankful that we get to be here. I'm thankful. How about this? You know, one thing I don't get to do enough. How about our Vine worship team, guys? Wasn't that incredible? The worship they did. I mean, that was awesome. That was a brand new song. Uh, and uh, I want to tell you that that song is absolutely awesome. And, 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 you know, as we were sitting there thinking and, 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 and reckless love was going on, it just made me think about Mother's Day again, where before we even took a breath, he knew us. He formed us in the womb. And so today I know that you're going to be excited. I know that you're going to be encouraged. And I know that you are going to be in a place where you're going to leave better than how you walk in. Because today I know uh, we have someone who's going to bring the message today who's actually been with us before. She, she shared with us last Mother's Day and we were all encouraged. And she was so awesome. I said, I got to get her back here again. If not, we got to cancel Mother's Day. Like we're just going to let Hallmark know. We're going to get all the cards out of the store. We're just going to call Mother's Day off until she's available. So I was so excited that she said yes when we get to do that. And I'm going to introduce her in just a moment, but here's the thing you know about us at the Vine Church is, hey, each and every week, if you've got a Bible, you can follow along. We have them free for the asking in the back. Just go ahead and give your neighbors a nudge and say, I want my free Bible. And we'll make sure that you can get one. Uh, those are free. If you're watching online, we'd love to get one in your hands as well. But also, we know that a lot of folks like to do things digitally. How many people like to look at the Bible on their phone? A lot of folks, if y'all could go ahead and hold those up and let me see the password to get in your phone and just a maiden name of someone or something, grandmother's maiden name. Anyway, uh, a lot of folks like to do it on their phone. So if you would like to watch and follow along on your phone right now, I'm gonna show you how you can do that. If you wanna download the Bible app, from your favorite app store, whatever that might be, go ahead and download that. And once you get there, go ahead and open it up, click on the more tab. Once you click on the more tab, go ahead and click on events. Now you're gonna make sure your location services is on for that. You'll see the Vine TV worship experience. Today you're gonna to see Mother's Day at the Vine and here's the cool thing about this. You can follow along with scripture if you like to do that. You won't have to flip through the pages of your Bible. You can see all the scripture we're gonna walk through today. But also, once again, here at the Vine Church, we wanna be a life and live a life of connection. You're gonna find ways that you can have our contact information. If there's any way that we can serve you throughout the week, because we know that tomorrow is Monday for most of us and all of us have to face Monday, right? So we wanna make sure that you have that information in your hands so that way you can follow with us, take your own notes and you can reach out to us. So without any further ado, y'all give a warm welcome and a round of applause for Starla Ellison as she comes up and brings an awesome message today. And while she is making her way up here, if you missed hugging a mother, you go ahead and you make that happen, all right? Or high five somebody. We did hugs. Maybe you're not a hugger. I'm not a big hugger. Get some high fives in. Oh, here are Tyler's, if anybody needs those. I have notes. Uh, I'm a teacher at heart, so I have a lot of notes. I have seven pages, 
and a friend of mine read through them, and she said, you're not going to talk about all that, are you? I said, no, no, just kind of six pages, that's all. Um, just six pages. When I told Nick, I said, you're going to have to help me up these steps again. He said, don't fall and embarrass me. I said, well, I'll try not to, but it wouldn't be the first time I publicly fail. So, you know, it's not that embarrassing to me. I've done it before. So I am a teacher, so it's hard for me to get up in front of people, and I hope I'm not rattled and scattered and all that. And if I am, please forgive me. I'm so sorry about that. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. Isn't it great being a mom now that your kids are adults like me and Nick and they're out of the house? Yeah? <laughs> I'm just kidding. It was pretty fun, too, when they were little. Sometimes I, um, I miss the sound of the basketball outside thumping. I really miss that sound. I miss the sound of my boys outside playing. I miss my daughter's door shut and her in her room quietly. <laughs> I miss my kids sometimes, but we are enjoying kind of being empty nesters. Um, I'll tell you just a few minutes about myself. Tyler knows I worry about time, so um, <laughs> I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, Nick and I have been married. It's almost 31 years in July. We have three kids. Allison is 29. She is married to Ben. Ben is a youth pastor at Bethlehem Baptist Church, and they have a little boy named Roman who'll be three, and he is the light of our lives. We love our little Roman. We have Cody, and Cody is here today. Cody is 26, and then we have our son, Johnny, who is 24, and both of my boys work together in Greenville at Circuit Board Medics. Cody doesn't live with us. Johnny does still. He likes to save a lot of money. So uh, Cody is very generous, and Johnny is, likes to save his money. That's why he still lives with us. But we love our kids. We enjoy being with our kids. We like doing family stuff together. Even though they're all adults, we just enjoy being together all the time. So uh, when Tyler contacted me again about speaking, I totally did not expect that at all. And I have actually kind of taken this year off from teaching. And I said, I'm just going to take a year off and just kind of be easy about some things. And so when he contacted me, I told Nick, I said, you know, I, I took the year off. And he said, well, that's speaking, not teaching. I said, oh, okay. He said, so you can do it. I said, all right, so we'll go ahead. And um, hopefully today you will get something out of that. But Tyler, I listened to last week's sermon, especially. It was excellent. If you all were not here and heard last week's sermon, it was great. As a matter of fact, I'm going back this week, and I'm going to listen again. It was so in-depth, and it's kind of funny. All the things that I have brought out, I don't know if you really recognize, but a lot of the verses I used was very similar to the things that you had talked about. So it was really excellent. And he told me, he said, this Vine team is awesome. And you guys just pull it together. The music, my goodness, that might be my new favorite song and it reminded me of the verse, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And we know as believers that we are hidden in Christ. So it just meant so much to me. I'm going to have to download that song. So last year when I came and spoke, a real good friend of mine, her name is Renee Berry. She's my teacher, instructor, counselor, mentor. I said, would you just listen to it and kind of see if, you know, I had any errors in there or anything like that? And oh, I'm a hands-on purpose uh, person here. I'm so sorry if I, I use my hands a lot. And she told me, she said, Starla, there's something that you did that I think you need to be aware of. And I said, okay, what was that? She said that you said, Lord, set me aside. And I said, well, you know, I don't, I, I don't want it to be of me. She said, but he is using you. He is speaking through you. Allow him to be who he is in and through you. So here I am. I'm like, this, this conversation went on with Moses and Jacob and Samuel. And all of them said, here I am, Lord. So here I am, use me. So I'm not going to say set me aside. Just speak through me as you choose to speak through me. I do have a lot of verses. I'm really sorry about that. But to get kind of the point across, um, 
what I want to speak about today, there will be a lot of verses. Everybody, does, does people like, kind of like that? A lot of verses digging deep in scripture? Because I sure do. This year, like I said, I took the time off from teaching. And so when you get a, a lesson together, you're really digging deep in scripture for one, two, three weeks. Dib, you know what? I can't tell you. I could not do this every week. I don't know how pastors every single week sit down and prepare a sermon. I don't know how I don't know how you do it. I really don't. And it just is I have an immense amount of respect. And not only that, you're bivocational. So I don't know if anybody's ever done anything like that, but try to sit down and write out a sermon or a lesson for a while, and then you'll begin to understand to even make it flow. So one thing that I cannot do is I cannot speak or teach what God has not spoke or taught to me. If Tyler had asked me to get up here and speak on a specific thing, if God had not spoke that into me, I would not be able to do that. That's just how I am. I can't get up here and fake it through it. I just can't. So what I am going to talk to you about is something that God has been speaking into me this last year. Not even just this last year, but the last 10 years of my life. Remember I had spoke to you last year about my testimony. I shared with you about how um, from the age of nine on, I went through a very traumatic experience. My mother was killed by a drunk driver. I was in the car with her. My little sister was in the car with her. And from that time on, I began to live as a little wounded nine-year-old girl until, you know, I met Nick in my teenage years, and we got married when we were 18 and 19. We started having children very early. We moved down here to South Carolina, away from all of our family and all of our friends, and it was just us and these three kids, and I had all of these super emotional problems. I dealt with anger, fear, depression, and you name it, I was a mess. And I lived that way for a long, long time. Uh, but when... Um, someone begin to speak into me the truth of who God is and who I am because of him. Oh my goodness, just the, the freedom and the victory that I begin to experience. And I've been walking in that for 10 and a half years now. So let's kind of get started here. We're going to focus on two main passages, but this first one is going to start in Luke. So if you could pull up Luke chapter four, but let me give you a little bit of, of, of what's going on here. In Luke chapter two, is about Jesus' birth. The end of chapter 3 is where John the Baptist was baptizing people for the repentance of sins. And basically, that is a just a symbolic baptism. It's changing your mind and your ways. It's you actually changing your mind and ways. It, there was really not a whole lot of spiritual significance, but getting people to try to change their minds and their ways is what John's was. And then Jesus went and he was baptized by John, and this began to lead to the, his three years of ministry. And then Luke chapter 4 starts with Jesus being tempted by the devil. And then he, after that, he goes out of the wilderness into Galilee. And in the region of Galilee, he goes to Nazareth, where he was born and raised. And um, so what's going on right here is Jesus is on the Sabbath, and he goes into the synagogue, and he stood up to read these words. And I'm going to go ahead and read from Luke here, because if you have notes, you'll see that. Luke chapter 4, 17 through 21. And the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. And he opened the book and found the place where it was written. Listen closely to these, to these words. This was from Isaiah chapter 61. And he was simply handed this. And Jesus read these words. Can you imagine being in that synagogue? You know, you went to a mosque last night. That might have kind of been like a synagogue. But can you imagine sitting there? And Jesus, he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, and he gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. So what is so neat about this is this was Jesus' Emancipation Proclamation. This was the original Emancipation Proclamation. And, you know, you can, I love definitions. And one of my favorite Bible teachers, he says, you stand or fall by your definitions. 
And so this is a definition of emancipation, the fact or process of being set free and can be from slavery. And then proclamation is a public or official announcement, especially one dealing with a matter of great importance. So what Jesus was doing, he was publicly, officially announcing that he has come to set the captive free. He has come to do something magnificent and wonderful. His emancipation proclamation is what he's doing, the original one. So after this, he begins his ministry. He gathers his disciples together, the ones that he would teach and prepare for the next three years. He was teaching them who God is and the good news of the gospel and preparing them that when he would no longer be with them. And he, then they, they went through the villages teaching and speaking, and, and Jesus was healing people of physical elements, ailments. Um, and, and so what he does is he is defining. What I would like to do, when I am studying Scripture, I like to really look at what the words mean. So what I tend to do, which you can't see this, is because I go word by word. And when he said, because he has anointed, anointed means appointed by God. So he has been appointed by God to preach the gospel. And the gospel is the full and complete message of the good news and to the poor. The poor are those who are spiritually impoverished, spiritually in poverty. Do you know? I mean, we live in America and we don't really know what poverty is. That means having nothing. Having nothing. And I don't know about you all, but that's me. I ain't got anything. I, I don't have any way to make myself right with God. I don't have any way to uh, heal my own sickness. I, I just don't have anything. I am one of the spiritually impoverished. And then it goes on to he has sent. That word sent means there is a defined mission. Jesus has a defined mission to proclaim. And this is pretty cool. Proclaim means to preach publicly and with persuasion. And we're going to talk about that word persuasion later. And then the word release means complete forgiveness. It means complete forgiveness and pardon. So he, has come, he was sent on a defined mission to publicly preach with persuasion complete forgiveness to the captives. That word captives, is this is the only time that is in scripture and it means a prisoner of war. And we are, aren't we? We are a prisoner of war. Because when Adam and Eve, Eve ate that fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that they were told not to do, that put all of mankind into slavery, to sin, and to death. So we are prisoners of war. And that is everybody born. If you have children, your children were born into slavery. You can't help that because everybody's in Adam now. Romans chapter 5 talks about that a lot, how we are either in Adam or we're in Christ now because we're on this side of the cross. And if you go on where it says the recovery of sight to the blind, that means he's going to give uh, sight spiritually, emotionally, mentally, and physically. He did a lot of physical blind, uh, healing of the blind. The blindness is that of those who have been imprisoned in darkness. And that was me for a long time. Till I was 38 years old, I feel like I just walked around in this darkness all the time. And I could probably tell you when it began and I began to recognize it. Of course, we're all born in darkness because we're born in Adam. But when my mom was killed in that car wreck, my mom was a stay-at-home mom. And she was a super hard worker. And she kept our house clean. Y'all, I, I, I tend to get that from her. I like a clean house. But she kept our house clean and sparkling. And we didn't have a whole lot. But what we did have, she took care of. And, you know, I came home from school on a Friday. And there was a light all in the house. And by Monday, my mom was dead. My whole life had changed. Nothing was ever going to be the same. And from the time I came home from school after that, our house was dark. So I felt like from the time I was nine years old, I was in darkness. And I wanted so much to have light. You know what I'm saying? I wanted to have light. And I didn't understand that it wasn't a physical light, but the light of Jesus. He is the light. I needed the light from the inside out. I needed to be removed from all of that darkness. 
And then it goes on to say, to set free those who are, who are oppressed. So on, he's sent on a defined mission of complete forgiveness. And this is what's neat, breaking open the prison of them that are bound. And ba that means pressed down, overpowered, stifled, weighted down. That's how I felt most of my life. I felt so pressed down. I'm afraid to walk too much in these hills. I need my running shoes on. But I felt like that all my life, so weighted down down by darkness and sin and oppression most all of my life most of my life till I was 38 until he came and he proclaimed the good news to me so I don't know about you all you know maybe you've walked in that like I have maybe you've been there like I have it's not a fun place to be to be so I, I like to use these words spiritually and solically solically because when we're doing counseling, when I, I do um, a type of counseling, and when we do counseling, we define what the spirit is and what the soul is. Because a lot of times we don't know. We don't know because the Bible does make a distinction and, and says we have a spirit and we have a soul. And I did not long, know that for a long time what the spirit was and what the soul was. But your soul is your mind, your will, and your emotions. It's how you think, how you feel, and the choices you make. And it all works together. So solically, I was very oppressed because mainly I was spiritually oppressed. I wasn't made right with God. So when I became a believer, uh, I was made right with God. My spirit came alive, but yet my soul still only knew how to function by what it had been taught through the world, through circumstances, through my family, through whatever it may have been. And so my soul, even though God was setting me free, it still was anchored to a lot of the things of the world. And we call that walking according to the flesh. By the way, that's what the flesh is. Coping with life with God, uh, with God, life apart from God. And a lot of times we don't use that word flesh and we don't know the definition of the word flesh. So we do need to know what the flesh is. It's the ways that we cope with life apart from God. It's the resources that were around us that are not from God. So I spent most of my life doing that. But here we are. We're on this side of the cross. And we need to make a distinction there because there was this before the cross. And honestly, people couldn't begin to be set free like we are today. I mean, we thank Jesus for us being on this side of the cross. We're on this side of the cross, his resurrection, and the ascension. Not just that, all of this works together because it wasn't just forgiveness of sins. It says that he ascended and that we are seated with him. So we are too. It's so mind-blowing, all of that. So we live in this time of promise that Jesus was talking about in Luke chapter 4. We actually live in this emancipation proclamation time. So if we live here, he preached the gospel uh, to the impoverished. He set free the, those from, that are oppressed. He enlightened the eyes of the spiritually blind. And he broke down the prison in chains that man is enslaved to. If you'll go to that next verse, is that it up there? Yeah. In Colossians chapter 1, 13 and 14, this absolutely amazes me. You know, Paul, my goodness, God just gave him such wonderful wisdom and insight. We thank God for Paul. And he wrote all this down for us. And, and so look at this. For he has rescued us. And that word rescued, it means he delivered us to himself for himself. For he rescued us, delivered us to himself and for himself from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Go, you remember back up there, the recovery of sight to the blind and those that walked in darkness? But he's transferred us. We are no longer children of darkness. We are now children of light. We are children of the kingdom of his son. The next verse says, if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. And then the next one, I think I've got it on this one. 2 Corinthians 3, 17. Now the Lord is spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And that means freedom, liberty, especially a state of freedom from slavery. Where the Lord is, there is liberty. Can I ask you all something? You don't have to raise your hands, but I'll gladly do it. How many of you here are born-again believers? You've placed it. So where is the Spirit of the Lord? 
in me. And, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is what? Liberty. There's freedom. Why in the world are we having Christians walking around so oppressed? Why? Why is that? Why are we as Christians dealing like I did for eight years after I became a believer with anger? And my son could stand up here and give you a whole list of anger issues that I dealt with. Yeah, let me tell you a story. Cody's going to get mad, but I can't help it. <laughs> when he started work at Circuit Board Medics, all of his people go to Grace Church over there in, in Greenville. And <laughs> he said, Mom, they're having a men's roundtable, and, and my, Ed, my boss, Ed, wanted me to go. And so he went to one time, and the next week he said, Oh, it's mother wounds. I'm so excited. I went, no, you have so much to talk about all the times I've wounded you. Sorry, Cody. Sorry, Cody. But, I, but it's true. It's true. I wounded my kids with my words and with my actions and my behaviors because I didn't know how to deal with all the stuff that was going on. You know, you guys understand, if you went through a trauma in your life at a very early age, and, and ever, there's a lot of trauma, not just the death of a parent. Oh, there's so much. There's so much trauma that can happen to a child. And if you go through that trauma at a very early age and you have not had anybody walk you through that, you've not had a counselor, you've not had a friend, you've not had anybody to walk you through that, and it's everybody's quiet from there on out, you don't know how to deal with anything. You only know how to deal with what you've been taught to deal with. And in my family, we were taught to scream and yell and slam doors and throw stuff. That's how we dealt with things. You know, I, I, I did not know any other way. You know, I just didn't know any other way. But the way of Jesus is not that way. The way of anger. The way of fear. The way of controlling what, everything so everything would be just right. Manipulation. I had to manipulate everything to get exactly what I wanted, whether it be through crying or screaming. It just was, a, I was a mess. Why? And then at 30, when I became a believer, you know, I, I ended up, when I'm going to do something, I do it pretty good. And so I became a good believer after that. You know, I was like, all right. I'm, I'm going, once I've realized it took, because <laughs> I didn't know it took, you know, it took me a few months to realize, I think I really did get saved. I think I did. I, I feel a little bit different. But then I began, and I had this, this intense thing for Scripture. I don't know why. I even did before I got saved. I bought a Bible and started reading it. I just had this intense desire to read the Scripture. So I became a good one. And then people realized that. They're like, you need to be teaching children because they're certainly not going to put you with adults yet. They train you up with the kids. It's crazy. So I said, okay, I'll do what you tell me to do. So I started with the kids. Then my kids were kids. And then my kids were teenagers. We helped with teenagers. And so you begin to study and read and, and all those things, which is a good thing. But when the whole purpose is just to learn more or to, to do all that, and it's not fellowship with Jesus, Michael Wells, who is my favorite author, he says, I can... Um, I read the Bible and pray not to get close to God, but I read the Bible and pray because I am close to God. And I was trying so hard just to be right and feel right and do right, and I wanted people to do that for me. I wanted people to give me some value and worth. See, in the counseling that we do, one thing we do is we start breaking down the lies that we have believed. And... Most people, they'll come in and they're saying, I'm anxious, I'm depressed, or, or all these feelings that they have. And then we have to start reaching back into their past, and I'll say, tell me about your relationship with your dad. Tell me about your relationship with your mom. And tell me about some circumstances that you've had in your life. And we begin to, together, look through all that. And we're looking for lies of the enemy, that the lies has come in, and we begin to live from those lies core lies. My core lie, and I told you last year, is that I have no value or worth. And so I had to do things to make me feel valuable and, and have worth, you know, to be worthy. And that's why I became such a good Christian, you know, why I was doing everything just right. 
So somebody please tell me I have value and I have worth. And, you know, because at home, as a mother, sometimes you don't feel that. You know, you've got the pressures of raising these little kids, and you're a mess anyway. You don't feel that. And that, that can be quite the struggle. So I needed some healing in my life. And then when people begin to speak these truths into me and I begin to live from my true identity, I experienced a lot of freedom. Last year when I was here, this is what I told you all. Uh, my whole life, I was trying to get someone or something to please tell me who I am, love me, accept me, validate me, give me worth, make me feel safe and secure. Because I needed to feel safe and secure. I shared with you how 10 years ago, broad, God brought me through this in and through himself from being a walk and wounded to living loved, which is my real identity. But one verse that God really, 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 really spoke to me is something we're going to read here. Uh, Jesus, uh, what, what's going on here is it's in uh, Mark chapter 5. And uh, there was a synagogue ruler, and his name was Jairus. And he begged Jesus to come and lay his hands on his daughter. His 12-year-old daughter was sick, and he wanted Jesus to come and lay his hands on him. So Jesus and the multitude who was always with Jesus went with J uh, Jairus to go see his daughter. And we're going to start in Mark chapter 5, verse uh, 25 through 34. A woman who had had a hemorrhage for 12 years and had endured much at the hands of many physicians and had spent all that she had had and was not helped at all, but rather had grown worse. After hearing about Jesus, she came up in the crowd behind him and touched his cloak, for she thought, if, if I just touch his garments, I will get well. Immediately, the flow of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her affliction. Immediately, Jesus, perceiving in himself that the power proceeding from him had gone forth, turned around in the crowd and said, who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing in on you? And you say, who touched me? And he looked around to see the woman who had done this. But the woman, fearing and trembling, aware of what had happened to her, came and fell before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. And what she did, she said, if I just, if I just. Have you ever got there? You ever been there? If, if I just, I cannot go on any further. I cannot do this anymore. I have went to every doctor, every herbalist, every chiropractor, every alternative medicine. I have done everything that I can do if I just touch and I know about that. I understand about all these things that you want to try to do to make you feel better. You know, I tried to do, I read all those books. I read them, every one of them. I tried to do all those things to set me free. Um, a couple of years ago, I have a sciatic problem. And, and my, my chiropractor told me, he said, it's because you're right-handed and you work with your right hand. And I clean houses and I'm all the time going like this. So I'm dealing with the sciatic problem in my right leg. And I'd been dealing with it for about seven years and not too bad, but achingly. And I'd been to a chiropractor. I'd done various things for it. And then it, I had a particularly bad week and weekend. And we'd went to Kentucky and we were on our way home. And, you know, you're sitting in all those hour, uh, hours riding in the car and it was just terrible. And Nick said, you know, I heard that baking soda helps inflammation. I went, well, I heard ginger did. So that night when I got home, we st I started mixing up baking soda and ginger, uh, powdered ginger, and drinking it in warm water. And about two weeks later, I began to realize my leg does not hurt. And I had went through seven years of this pain. That's crazy. Now, I do need to share with you about a month before that, when I was really struggling again, and I personally believe this, and you all can take it however you want, but I personally believe this. I anointed my leg with oil, and I prayed over my leg. I come from the background. I was raised Nazarene. I do believe in anointing with oil. Uh, if a person is sick, they should go to the elders of the church, and they should be anointed with oil. That did happen in my life, and I know that is true. So I thought, well, I'm going to do this. I do believe God led me to the baking soda and ginger to heal my leg. I do deal with it every now and then, but not quite like I did two years ago and for years before that. When um, 
the car wreck that uh, my mom died in, my sister Karen was seven at the time, and she was hurt really, really bad. She had uh, head injuries, and the car landed down on top of her. We were sitting right beside each other, and the car landed down on her and not me. Isn't that crazy? Her head fell on my lap. It was just crazy, but she had all this. Uh, she, she still has all these scars. All right. <laughs> she still has, you know, the scars, but, you know, we don't see any of them or anything. And my grandparents took her before the church, our little Nazarene church, and the elders prayed over her because she could not see in her eye. The um, battery had exploded plus her injuries that she could not see out of her eye. And they took her before the church, and she could see out of that eye. And, you know, it's really amazing. As you look at the pictures of my sister growing up, like her second grade picture, her third grade, fourth grade, her eye, the color comes back in her eye throughout the years. You literally can see it. It's amazing. So I know God still does physical healing. So I, on that little tangent, because I, I'm like everybody else, we've used all the herbalists, the chiropractors, the doctors, because we're, we feel so bad. And when you feel bad physically, you're going to feel bad emotionally. I don't know many people that experience in a lot of emotional freedom when they feel physically bad. And can you imagine how this woman looked? She was thin. She was anemic. She was weak. She was probably miserable. She probably didn't have much energy. And she probably hadn't been for years and years and years. She was at the end of her rope, the walking wounded. And so she said, if I just touch. Now, this is a conditional word. And in this case, it involves action. She had to touch. She had to do that. If I just touch the hem of his garment. And she believed that if she did, that she would get well. But she had a choice here. She could have said, mm, uh, no, I don't, probably not. I don't think I'm going to go. And started to begin with the thousand excuses. And I hear that all the time. The thousand excuses of why. We're not living in freedom. There's so many excuses why we won't let God heal us from the inside out. So she could have done all that, but she didn't. Instead, she reached out and she touched it. And immediately, immediately, she was healed of her affliction. And this, this is the best part because I'm a very visual person. And, and I auditory, I listen to a lot of audio books while, while I clean. And so when I'm listening to a book... I'm also visualizing what's going on during that book. Can you imagine what, what happened here? She looked, and he's looking for her and at her. Out of all this multitude of the crowd, he's looking for her and right at her into her eyes. I don't know about you all, but that to me has got to be the most amazing experience she has ever had in her life, to have Jesus looking at her face-to-face, eyeball-to-eyeball. And I, I've always said, I can't wait. The minute I step over into heaven, I can't wait to see. What color are your eyes, Jesus? I just want to know, what color are your eyes? I'm so excited about that. I want to, but I've experienced that in my life to a point, him looking straight at me, looking at me, wanting to heal me and be himself to me. I've looked at that and I've seen him do that in me and through me. So let's kind of look at this a little bit. Let's kind of see, let's talk a little bit more. Why are people so spiritually impoverished? Why are so many believers ensla enslaved to sin and to unbelief? Because a lot of it's they just don't believe. They're unbelieving believers. Why are so many believers still blind to spiritual truth and live for the temporal things of this world? than rather the eternal things. You mentioned that last week. You talked about that. Why are so many believers still living in self-imposed prisons, prisons of the past, prison of unforgiveness, all these prisons? Why? Why are we still chained? Why are so many believers not living the abundant and victorious life? Did you know that according to Romans chapter 5, I mentioned this a minute ago, we are a new race of people? We are a new creation in Christ. That, that, that word, new creation, is something that had never, ever existed before in 2 Corinthians 5.17. We are a new race of people. According to the scriptures, there's only two races, those in Adam and those in Christ. Those in Christ did not exist before the cross. It was only in Adam. So here we are. 
We are a new race of people. We are in Christ. We spiritually participated in his death, his burial, and his resurrection, Romans chapter 6. We were baptized into. We were placed into. That's what that means, placed, immersed into Christ. And when he died, our sinful inner man died. When he arose, he gives us a new inner man, our spirit, that he lives within. We have a new father. We have a new heart, Ezekiel 36, 26. I used to tell people, oh, no, you have a wicked heart. And then somebody said, well, Scripture says you get a new heart. I went, oh, yes, it does. Didn't get that before. Gives us a heart of flesh that is living and alive instead of a heart of stone. So we have a new heart. Our body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Our new self, our inner man, our spirit, which is in God, has been created in righteousness and in holiness and of the truth. So knowing all of what I just said, why are we living like that? Why are we living enslaved? And that's how I was until I was 38, decaying emotionally, angry, wounded, and traumatized. And I thought that. I thought I'd be like this for the rest of my life. But see, I just wanted to be healthy. I wanted to be healthy spiritually. I wanted to be healthy solically. I wanted to be healthy physically. I wanted to be healthy in all ways so I could have healthy relationships. So I could have uh, a healthy relationship with my kids and with my husband and with all the people I'm around. Even a healthy relationship with the people I work for. You know, I wanted it in all areas of my life. So somebody forgot to tell me that he set the captive free. Why? Why hadn't I heard that? Why hadn't I heard that as a good believer for eight years that the captive had been set free? Nobody really explained that there's an abundant, victorious life. Um, And this is it, though. If they did, I probably would have thought it was material possessions. You know, if I have a lot of stuff and I get to do a lot of things and I have a lot of money in the bank, I thought that was abundant life. I had it so wrong. I didn't know. So one day, and I did tell you about this, and Will spoke here last year, uh, we were very active in the youth group. And my kid's youth pastor was Will Gunter. And Will began to speak some different words into us. Will did and some others did, Scott Wolf, um, um, Joe Burnett. They began to speak some different words into me, words that I, I didn't know, and I began to think, that can't be true. Seriously, that can't be true. And when they begin to explain all that, words like Jesus is abundant and victorious life and he lives in you, you were baptized into Christ, his death and resurrection, you were crucified with Christ, wow. You have a new inner man, the sinful inner man, old sinful inner man is dead. You're dead to sin and alive to God. Christ is your life. Those words were so new to me. I'd never heard that. Christ is my life in Colossians 3, 4. He is my life. And then one day I was reading the scriptures and I did come to that verse. And it says, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. See, He spoke those very words to me, not just to her. He looked at me and he said, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. And he said, daughter. And you see that verse right there? But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of man, but of God. See, I didn't understand In our world, we're all told we're children of God. That's what the world says. All these religions, you you probably got a taste of that last night. Say, oh, we're all children of God. Well, we're all created in his image, that's for sure. But we're not all children of God. Scripture is very clear on that. It says that if you're still in Adam, then Satan is your father. And that is crazy to me. If you go outside and you begin to meet unbelievers... Look, because they still have their old spiritual identity in Adam, and they, their spiritual father is Satan because they were born in Adam, and when we're physically born, we are not connected to God in any way. So Satan is our father. That was a big deal for me. And then uh, Becky Oliver, my pastor's wife, she said, do you believe that we're all children of God? I said, oh, well, sure, yeah. And she said, No. She's, and then she began to tell the scriptures to me, and this was one of them. Are born not of blood or the will of the flesh, but born of God. And then Romans eight fifteen, for you have not received a spirit of slavery leading again to fear. Well, amen to that. 
but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons. Now this word in the helps word study means anyone sharing the same nature as the Father, which we cry out, Abba, Father. We are, you know, not everybody here is a mother. Not everybody here is a sister. Not everybody here is a female. <laughs> but you can be sons and daughters. We are all sons and daughters. And the thing of it is, is when God speaks that into you, and you guys, I know you went through something very traumatic when you were young, that, you know, your father passed away at a young age. And so you grew up like I did, but I was without the mother figure. You was out the, without the father figure. And for God to become a father to you, a father to the fatherless, that is so important that he calls you daughter and you son. Because you have an ability now to live as a daughter or a son, beloved child of God, one with inheritance. And it doesn't matter if, you know, like raised like Nick by his grandparents were not raised by his parents, you know, or if your father was abusive or distant or distracted or there's so many things that it could be. Or you could have had a great dad, you know. I don't know. But here, when you are born again, and in John, but Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, and he tells Nicodemus, he says, you must be born again. And Nicodemus is like, you know, I can't go back in my mother's womb. But that word born again, that word again means from above. And if you look in your Bible, if you guys study Bible, let's say that. If you're born from above, if you're born from above, you have a new father. So that means a lot to me to know that I'm his daughter and he's going to take care of me. He is going to take care of me and love on me. And not only me. He's going to take care of my kids. Because if my kids are born again believers, they're his daughters and sons too. And then it goes into faith. And I love the, what the word faith means. Um, I don't think I have it on there right now. Uh, it'll get there. Oh, let me read you this one, one more verse. Um, I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters to me, says the Lord God Almighty in 2 Corinthians 6.18. I don't think that's on your paperwork. And then uh, Galatians 4, 6 says, Because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So when that time, if you've, if you've had a difficult relationship with your um, biological father or something like that, you can cry out to your spiritual father, to your father, and let him heal that, that hurt inside of you. So the word faith, um, I was had been desperately sick of myself. I mean, seriously, what, you get to a point where you're just sick to death of yourself. You're sick to death of you walking around like this all the time, and you're just sick to death of yourself. And I finally came to the last straw, and I said, I'm done. I'm done. I can't do this Christian life anymore. It's too hard. I gave all that I had to give, and I don't have any more to give. Um, I, I, I'm not any different than I was before, to be honest with you. I'm a believer, but I still with the, deal with the same issues. I, I, I've got a good mask on me. I act real good spiritual, but I'm really no different before. I cried out to the Lord, if you are God, then you're going to have to be God. You're going to have to prove yourself to me. And what I meant was that you're going to have to show me who you are. Because I, I just can't do this anymore. And I laid everything aside. I laid everything aside. I laid aside my Christian jewelry, my Christian music. To this day, I still don't listen to a lot of Christian radio. I just needed God to be God. I, all my Christian stuff, I just, I just put it all up. And I said, I, I need him. I need Jesus. I need Jesus. And, and that was my conditional if. If I'm going to be healed, you're going to have to do it. And where hers was, I got to touch the hem of his garment. He said, I said, you're going to have to do it because I can't do it anymore. He told her, your faith has made you well. And, you know, he did that to many different people. And the word believing, uh, it's, it's 4,100. Do you know what Strong's Concordance is and all that stuff? All right, so we dig deep into those words. So 4,100 is belief. And the word belief means um, it inverts faith. When you believe, it inverts faith. And the word faith, it may be on there in a little bit. We'll look at it in a minute. In a minute. But the word faith means divine persuasion. God is divinely persuading us 
to believe and trust, and then goes back into inbirthing more faith, which is so cool. The word faith comes from the word persuade. I had no idea. He's persuading us. So that goes back to that persuasion that we had talked about. And I love that. So after I did that, he began to persuade me that he had set me free and he had healed me. See, faith, if you'll look, which verse are we on right there? Okay, the Ephesians verse. I began, I needed to know what the faith, word faith really meant. So if divine persuasion, if you, we're not on that one yet. But let's look at this. There is one body and one spirit. Oh, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord and one faith. There is one faith. In the scripture, it talks about um, a lot of different religions, but there's only one faith. And then it says the fruit of the spirit, one of the fruit of the spirit is faithfulness. So it's who God is through us. And then in Revelation 19.11, I'm going pretty fast, I'm sorry. It says that, I saw heaven opened up and behold a white horse and he who sat on it called faithful and true. So it is who Jesus is. Isn't that amazing? There's one faith and it is a fruit of who he is within us, faithfulness, and his name is faithful. So it's him who is faithful. It's going to have to be his faith through me. And then my favorite verse is, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives within me. And the life I live in the flesh, and that means the physical body. And the verse actually in the Greek says, by the faith of the Son of God. So it's by his faith that I live. He loved me and gave himself for me. So it's by his faith that we live. So I was learning that it was through Christ that I was going to have to be able to live. It was him living in and through me. So if it's got the definition for faith, is that on there? Maybe not? Okay. Faith is always a gift from God and never something that can be produced in people. In short, faith for the believer is God's divine persuasion and therefore distinct from human effort yet involving it. The Lord continually births faith in the yielded believer so they can know what he prefers, prefers the profession of his will. So I live by his faith. And then if you go to the word, may, um, he made you well, that word healed is in the Greek, it's sozo, and it means save. Isn't that amazing? This is where we get our word savior and salvation from. And it means saved, healed, and rescued, deliver out of danger and into safety. God rescuing believers from the penalty and power of sin and in his safety and precision. Um, provision so he's delivered us out from before to his safety and the word go in peace did you know anybody know anybody named Irene because Irene means peace isn't that crazy so if you ever meet Irene say oh you're peace she may not get that but that's what it means and then peace means to tie together into a whole properly wholeness in other words when all essential parts are joined together Peace is God's gift of wholeness. It's being whole solically, spiritually, and physically, but mainly spiritually and solically. Your mind and your and will and your emotions are having a soul harmony. And that was that's something Dr. Caroline Leaf, who is a neuroscientist and a Christian, she goes on about that a lot, about your soul being harmony, your mind, your will, and your emotions. Because when your mind is at peace and at rest, and living from Christ and being renewed, then your emotions will also, and so will your choice and de choices and decisions after that. Isn't that amazing? That works together like God created us to work together. So spiritually and solically in, chaos, in, in harmony instead of chaos. This way you're not walking according to the flesh, but according to the spirit, and you're being who God created you to be. And then the word be healed. Again, that means sound, healthy, and whole. And I give you the Greek word. And it means sound and thus free from. So you are sound and whole and you're free from. And I just, I love how God uses those over and over and over again to have a healthy and sound mind, a healthy and sound emotions, and healthy and sound choices. You know, if you do that, I don't know how many of you are not married yet. But if you begin to live from Christ within you and you begin to make healthy and sound choices and you have a healthy and sound mind and healthy and sound emotions and you begin to live bodily out of that and you go into marriage, your marriage is going to be much better. 
much better because you're going to walk into marriage healed instead and whole and sound instead of like what we did a mess and then 12 years later we get saved and then we still have to deal with learning to live with each other and the baggage that we both carried into marriage think about that do you want to be sound healthy and whole now or do you want to you know so many people just choose to live the rest of their life oppressed and then the word affliction and it means a disease carried with the torturous level of pain it's scourging it stresses its pain and debilitating after after effects and that's how i felt a lot of the time i felt in pain and had a lot of after effects after that jesus came to set you free captive blind oppressed destitute enslaved and imprisoned mind will and emotion hebrews says that he is the anchor of our soul and when our spirit has been made alive and he lives within us and he is liberty our soul is anchored into that that is living the life he came to give us to live so when god spoke these words into my heart daughter you have been saved healed and rescued you live this life from my faith, which is in you. I am your life. You have been united to me and joined to me. There's, there's all verses with these. My gift to you is wholeness and peace. Live from my peach, peace, which is in you. Enjoy the good health I have gifted you with. Because of me, you are healthy in your spirit. Experience my joy within you. How many joyful Christians do we have? You can be, if you choose to be, healthy and sound solically in your mind your will and your emotions you now have the mind of christ and your mind can be renewed by him in your will i can do all things through christ who strengthens me in your emotions do not be anxious for anything cast your cares upon the lord and then when jesus has come to me all you are weary and heavy laden i will give you rest for your souls rest 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 and then hebrews 12 says fix your eyes on jesus otherwise you're going to grow weary and lose heart and let's look at first peter it's on there he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness by his wounds you have been healed that's the word sozo saved and rescued taken out of one place and put into another beloved i pray that all may go well with you that you may be in good health as it goes with your soul your mind your will and your emotions john 10:10 10, 10, the thief comes to steal kill and destroy but I have come that you have life and have it abundantly. And that steal, kill, and destroy is for those that are prisoners of war, captive, and enslaved. Second Peter 1, 3-4, his divine power has granted us everything that we need for life and godliness. That means to live a God-centered life. Through the true knowledge of him, who he is and what he has done, who called us by his own glory and excellence. For by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises so that you may become a partaker, which is a sharer and a participant of his divine nature. It's wonderful. And when this daughter of God began to experience from the inside out who God is and who I am because of him, let me tell you, my soul began to experience transformation. Honestly, y'all, it was like the, the floodgates of heaven had just opened up inside of me and just started gushing in and through me. That's just how, and I felt like that for the last 10 and a half years. This is not just some moment thing. This is what God has done in my life. The abiding life. I abide in him and he abides in me. The abundant life, the victorious life. Remember when Jesus said, if anyone is thirsty, let, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture says, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. He told that to the woman at the well. He was a living water, didn't he? Listen to that. Whoever believes in me and comes to him out of from the inside out is going to flow living water not dead water living water not soured or skewed or nasty water pond water sometimes but living water christ himself so what what i begin to do and i'm going to live you give you a list of 10 things to do to get this no i'm not because there's not a list this is it you just believe simply believe 
Did he really do what he came to do? Did he really, did he really do it? Did he come and set that captive free? What was the purpose of the cross? His death, burial, resurrection, and ascension. Did he do it? And then believe it. That's simply it. And then you have an intentional relationship with him. Not a list. Oh, oh, wait. Check off my quiet time today. Nothing wrong with the quiet time. Nothing wrong with that at all. But if you're doing it just to do it and check off a list, there's no purpose in that at all. Read my Bible today. Did a good deed today. Whatever it may be. Whatever it may be. He wants you to have an intentional relationship with him where you are looking eye to eye with him. You are spending time with him. You are getting to know him because it says in Second Peter here, the true knowledge of him. If you don't have this intentional time with him, you're not going to get to know him. Can you imagine getting married and you're leaving the church and you say, we'll see ya. No, you're going on a honeymoon and you're going to get to know each other even more. And then you're going to spend the next year and the next year and where me and Nick are, 31 years getting to know each other. We're still getting to know each other. That's what it is like with Jesus. This is the most important relationship you will ever have. This is the foundation of everything, this relationship with Jesus. I didn't go to him with my list. I went to him with a vulnerable and yielded heart. I truly wanted him. I had a desperate longing. So I pray the same desire for you guys, that you have a vulnerable and yielded heart, a receiving heart. And that's moment by moment, moment by moment. Not just, I did that yesterday. I might do that next week, but a yielded heart to Jesus, moment by moment. And where is Tyler? He's right there. If it wasn't too scattered. No, you're good. How about how about a hand right quick for for Starla? That was absolutely incredible. And you're going to see the band come up. Our Vine worship team come up. All right, all right, we're good. Uh, and, and as they get ready, you know, Starla nailed it here at the end. You know, why we do what we do at the Mind Church is this. Every week, we want to create a space where you can have a relationship with Jesus. Because here's the thing, you can do it your way. Living proof standing up here, you can do it your way. You can say all the right words. You can, you can, you can, you can rehearse all the right lines. You can have all the memory verses done. You can pray all the prayers, but it's faith. It's faith. It's belief, because the thing is, if you don't have faith, there's no way you're going to get through. You're just going to keep circling back around, and you're going to deal with the same old junk time and time again. And what I wanted to remind you of here at the end as we get ready to create this space for you to respond is, is Ephesians 2 says it this way, verse 4 and 5, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive in Christ when we were dead in our transgression, he made a way where we're not walking. No longer are we a create. No longer are we just in Adam's creation. We are a new creation in Christ Jesus. We don't have to walk around somber. We don't have to walk around defeated. We don't have to walk around beat up. We can have life. We can have purpose. We can have hope. And it's not by our works. You see, it ends this way. It says, it is by grace you have been saved. Not because you said the right thing, not because you knew the right Bible verse, not because you prayed the right prayer, it's faith, it's what you believe. And so today, as we have this moment and we're creating this space and this place for you to respond, I'm gonna ask everyone to close their eyes and I just wanna ask you, have you ever believed? Can you say today that you have believed because we have people who wanna walk with you through this, we're gonna pray together as a family. And once again, it's not the words of this prayer it's the faith of this prayer. And maybe today you, you've responded and you have a relationship with Jesus. I want this prayer to remind you that he died to set you free, that he died so that you could have purpose, so that you no longer are defeated in chains, so that you will know that your faith has made you well. So with every head bow and every eye closed in this moment, I'm gonna ask everyone to repeat these words after me for the benefit of those who were coming to faith for the first time. Dear Jesus, I believe I'm a sinner separated from you. I believe you came, lived the life I couldn't live, died the death I deserved on the cross, 
but loved me enough not to stay dead, but rose again so that I may have life. Come take over my life, Lord. Teach me to follow you step by step the rest of my life the best way I know how. And for everyone here, if it's, I'm about to count to three and I'm gonna ask you to respond. If you can say for the first time today, you have been truly set free by your faith. I'm gonna count to three and I'm gonna ask you to raise your hand whether you're watching online or in this house. One, two, three. If that's you today and you can say for the first time that you have prayed that prayer with faith, I'm gonna ask you to respond. If you're watching online, you're going to see a hand raised. If you're, if you're listening to a podcast, I want to have a way for you to respond as well. If you will let us know at prayer at divine.tv or even call us or shoot us a text message at 864-580-6698. We have people who want to celebrate with you. And for everyone else in the room, I'm going to pray here in a second and we're going to worship in this last song. But I just want to ask and what I'm going to be asking Jesus for you is that he reminded you in that prayer that you were set free. Starla spent so much time today showing you what Jesus said, what Jesus showed us, that we are a new creation set free to go bring the light into a dark, dark world. So I'm just going to ask, maybe you've had faith in the past. I'm going to ask him to remind you of that faith today. So dear Jesus, thank you for this time. Thank you that we have the opportunity once again to come to your house to lift your name high. Jesus, we are nothing without you. We know that with you, we have life and that with you, we can live it to the full. So Jesus, I ask you today to just remind us, remind us that you are the living water. Remind us that you came to set us free. Remind us who we are in you, Jesus. It's not what this world says we are. It's not what our last name says we are. It's not what our career says we are. It's not what our bank account says we are. It's not what the car we drive says we are. Jesus, we are who you say we are. So in this moment, I would ask that you remind us of faith, the faith we have in you. Remind us that it's not about having, having the most Bible verse memorized and, and, and praying the exact right prayer. Jesus, it's just the surrender and faith to you. Remind us, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Y'all stand and sing with us. You unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone. So I'm no longer slave.
All right, as we close up today, as always, I'm going to ask everybody to lock it up, get your arms around somebody. I'm just going to pray over us for the week. I'm going to pray that this Mother's Day be the best yet. But also, I just, once again, want us to remind it that we are children of God. If we have a relationship with Jesus, we are children of God. And if we don't, I pray that everyone Jesus puts in our path that don't know who Jesus is, we show them who he is and meet them right where they are and walk with them step by step and point them to him. So let us pray. Jesus, thank you for this time again. Thank you that you came to this earth and you made a way to set us free so that we could be called your children, that we no longer had to be children of Adam, that we no longer had to be children of this world, God, but we had eternity with you. So Lord, right now, I pray in this moment again that you just remind us what it is to be your child, that you show us the people around us. Jesus, break our hearts for others who don't know you because they're in our midst and they're in our path. And so, Lord, I pray that we would just show them you. As the great Billy Graham said, Lord, it's, 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 it's your job to judge. It's the Spirit's job to convict. And Jesus, it's just our job to love. So today, especially this day, that's Mother's Day. I pray that we would love others the way that you love us like never before. And so, Jesus, we put all that we are into you. We love you, Lord. It's your name we pray. Amen. Come hang out with us again next week as we continue. I want to believe, but, and as always, the best is still yet to come.